really excited for the opportunity to speak with you because I think Asia needs to hear more of what you have to say, uh, especially in the areas of trauma, um, you know, stress, anxiety, and more importantly, child development as well, parenting, right? But I want to also say that your work has been far-reaching. Really, I think, for me, I got to know about you um, through the YouTube videos about three years ago and have been following you ever since and read your book. So thank you for this opportunity to speak with me. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. It's so nice to meet you. First and foremost, I wanted to also ask you, what are you most passionate about in your work in the area of addiction, stress, and child development, childhood development? What I'm most passionate about is to understand why people suffer. So as a physician, I dealt with all kinds of suffering, cancer, autoimmune disease, mental health issues in children and adults, addictions, anxieties, depressions. And so why are people suffering? And the answer is, in one word, trauma. And trauma shows up on the individual level, it shows up on the social level, and it makes people behave in ways that are hurtful to them and to other people. So you might say it's the question of suffering and trauma, and then how to heal that. So it's healing that, you know, it, the reason I'm curious about the source of suffering is so that we can look towards healing. Yeah. And maybe you can also share with us, what is your definition of trauma, Dr. Gabor, as you have also, you know, shared in your book, The Myth of Normal, because for us in Asia, most of us hear the word trauma and we immediately think, immediately think oh, no, that's not me, because it's such a huge word, or you must have had experience like, a catastrophe to have had trauma. So what is your yeah. definition of trauma? Yeah, it's true. People often think of trauma as something terrible, atrocious happening, like sexual abuse or yeah. emotional abuse, or a tsunami, or a war, or a terrible earthquake in which a lot of people die. And those events are very traumatic, of course, for a lot of people. But that's not what trauma right. is. Well, the word trauma itself comes from a Greek word for wound or wounding. So trauma is a wound. And you can wound people, especially vulnerable people, in many ways. And nobody's more vulnerable than children. So children can be wounded in many ways. Yes, they can be wounded if they're beaten, if they're neglected, mm. if they're abused. That can wound them. But they can also be wounded if the needs are not met, if they're not seen for who they are, for, if they're not accepted for the wonderful little creatures that they are, if they are criticized a lot, um, if they get the sense that they have to prove their value to the parents by being nice and cooperative or mm. good, you know. So that wounds the person because we all need to be accepted for we are as human beings. So, so people, I've seen many people suffer mental illness and physical illness who were not traumatized in the big sense of the word. So that's yeah. the big key trauma. But as in the, about a, pointed in the first chapter of this book, you mentioned the myth of normal. There's a small T trauma in which children just don't have their needs met. And as a result, that distorts their development. Wow. I also heard you say before that, you know, we all have imprints of trauma that we bring with us throughout our lives. And you, you relate it back a lot to its origins, which is really our childhood experiences. And yeah. I wanted to touch a little bit more about that because even in personality traits, so-called personality traits like people-pleasing and workaholism, yeah. these are traits that have in, in your in, in your research and your, your 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 studies have shown that have developed because of one's childhood experiences. Can you talk us through that? Because for me and Dr. Gabo, I'll be very honest to say that I I have a disease to please. I am a people yeah. pleaser. And it wasn't until I heard you talk about that it is because of how our childhood experiences were that made us who we are today that really made me reflect back on my earlier days as well. Well, let me just ask you, yeah. this this drive of yours to please people, how does what is the impact on you? The impact on me is that sometimes I feel burned out. I, burned out. So fatigue, yeah. burned out, yeah. I, I feel like I am suppressing something. How I does that feel? Feel, and how does that feel to suppress something? Sometimes I feel inauthentic. Okay, so the two of the impacts that you mentioned are burnout, fatigue, and feeling disconnected from your true self, not yeah. being other. Yeah. Well, those are that's a pretty heavy price to pay, you know. And I found over the years that when I was looking after very ill people, they had those characteristics. Uh, and there's a reason why women have 80% or 70% of autoimmune disease. Autoimmune diseases are those diseases where the immune system attacks the body itself. For example, you know, to arthritis or lupus or psoriasis or um, some forms of diabetes or multiple sclerosis. 
Now, these diseases happen mostly to women. Why is that? It's because women are the ones who are brought up from childhood to suppress themselves, wow. to suppress to suppress their healthy anger, to be very nice to people, to look after everybody else's needs and ignore their own, and to feel responsibility mm -hmm. for other people, their husbands and their, you know, their families. And those traits, when you suppress yourself emotionally, you're also suppressing your immune system. And because the, the emotions, Asian medicine has always known this. You can't separate the mind from the body. Yeah. Ancient, Chinese, ancient Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine of India or indigenous medicines around the world have always understood that mind and body are inseparable. So what happens emotionally also happens physiologically. Now, the funny and the sad thing is this is not being proven by Western science. So we know that you can separate the mind from the body, but doctors trained in the Western tradition are not given that information. Mm. Now, these traits of being nice and people pleasing and suppressing yourself. I, I don't know if you have children, but yes, have you I ever have a, I have a son? He's a two year old. Okay, great. He's two years old. Yeah. When you when you turn when your son was a day old, do you think he ever suppressed his feelings? No. Did he try to be nice to please you? No. Nobody's born like that. So we developed these traits because we are given the impression or the message that unless you're pleasing me and I'm your parent, I won't accept you the way you are. So to be accepted, which you have to be accepted from by me, otherwise you can't survive, you have to suppress yourself. So these traits are not natural. They're not healthy. Uh, nobody's born with them, but we're programmed into them. And by the way, what's another word? You know, take something like depression. What does it mean to depress something? It means to push it down. Push down. Yeah. So what gets pushed down in a so-called disease of depression? What gets pushed down? People's emotions. Nobody's born pushing down their emotions. They push down their emotions if the environment, their families can't accept their emotions. And the child gets a message that if I feel my emotions, like my anger or my grief, they won't like me. So then unconsciously, the child pushes down their emotions, and 30 years later, they do, they diagnose with this disease, so-called disease of depression. So yeah. it all it all begins. It all begins with early childhood and how we are forced, in a sense, to disconnect from ourselves in order to survive in our environment. Wow. So there is a direct correlation, you know, especially like what you shared earlier, uh, when we suppress our emotions, our healthy anger, basically it's just suppressing ourselves. There is a direct correlation with that and diseases physical uh, oh, absolutely health. oh yeah i know it's been shown uh by, by by all kinds of studies well think about it for a minute let's say this is not going to happen just a yeah. thought experiment if yeah. in this if in this conversation i began to be insulting or inappropriate with you yeah okay what would be your healthy response my healthy response would be that i would speak up and stop right. stop it exactly. from happening. yeah you'd say stop it yeah that's healthy anger yeah and healthy anger protects your boundaries. Mm -hmm. It means that I won't be able to transgress those boundaries and hurt you emotionally or physically. Mm -hmm. So anger, health, healthy anger, not rage, but healthy anger is a boundary defense. Our brains have circuitry for anger. Now, the immune system. What's the job of the immune system? It's to protect our health from... It's, it's to protect your boundaries. Yeah. It's to keep out what's unhealthy like unhealthy bacteria or toxins, yeah. but let in nutrients, let in healthy organisms. Yeah. So the job of healthy anger is exactly the same as the job of the immune system. Yeah. Now, here's the scientific news. The two are the same thing. It's not that there's an immune system over here and an emotional system over here. It's all part of a big system. Wow. So when you're, affect when you're pushing down one, you're affecting the other. It's that simple. And this wow. is this is not my brilliant insight. It's it's what I saw in my patients, but it's been studied and studied and studied. This, you know, and in my book, The Myth of Normal, I provide some of the scientific evidence for what I've just said. Mm. And and Dr. And Dr. Gabal, going back also to you know, um, for example, people pleasing trait like myself, right? And and these are also uh, imprints from my childhood experiences. What can I do? What would you advise me to do? You know, to slowly work towards healing, and instead of this compulsive need to constantly meet everyone else's needs but mine, yeah, at the expense of myself. Well, we've already looked into a little bit of what to do about it. So the yeah. So um, 
the, the first question is, are you willing to be compassionate with yourself? Are you willing to try to be compassionate with yourself? Yeah. Okay. So let, let, let's just do a little exercise if you want. Yes. Okay. And this is in the book as well. Yeah. Tell me, tell me where in your life you have difficulty saying no. I mean, when there's a no that wants to be said, but you don't say it because you want to please others. So that happens in personal life and it happens in work. Yeah. So does that happen to you? That there's a no that wants to yes. be said, but you don't say it. Yes. Uh, when <laughs> someone needs some time with me, be it over a 30 minute meeting yeah. or a 30 minute lunch together. Yes. And you don't feel like it. But you say yes anyway, yeah? Yeah. And sometimes okay. always because I am, I'm too tired or exhausted, but I end up... Okay. okay, so that's the first question. Where do you have trouble saying no, okay? Second yeah. question is, I've already asked you, what's the impact? The impact is that you yes. get burnt out. Yeah. By the way, when you get burnt out, that's not just bad for you. It's also bad for your son. Yeah. Because now, mommy is not so available. Yeah. You know, so you're affecting other people as well. You know, so so the first question is, where do I have trouble saying no? Second okay. question is, what's the impact? The third question is, what is the belief that has me not saying no? So what's, what, what, what am I believing that stops from saying no? So let me ask you then, Rachel. So what do you believe? If you say no, then what? What does that mean? Um, that either people would, would not feel good, that they would think poorly of me. Yeah, they might. Yeah. Well, and so? And let, so, me, let, let me ask you this. Yeah. If, if I was in Singapore and, uh, and and you heard that I was in Singapore, okay? Yeah. And you phone you up and said, Gabor, do you want to, can you meet me before half an hour? And I said, Rachel, I'm so sorry, but I'm just so tired. And my, mm -hmm. my, my schedule is totally booked. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't meet you. Would you think badly of me? No. And if you did think badly of me, should I care about that? No. Okay. Well, look what you're doing to yourself, though. You, wow. In other words, do you notice that you're being kinder to me than you're being to yourself? Wow. Because, and and so that's what I asked. Are you willing to be compassionate towards yourself? Because you want, if you're willing to be compassionate towards yourself, then you say, I, Rachel, also have the right to say no, just like my friend Gabor has the right to say no. Mm. Okay? Yes. So, so there's this story. Now, here's the problem. When you're a child, you learned that you didn't have the right to say no, because then people would think badly of you. Now, if you think badly of me, too bad, but I don't care. Mm. You know, I mean, I might look at it, did I do something wrong, but it wouldn't affect my life. Mm. So Rachel is disappointed that I didn't have to meet with her, okay? Yeah. But if you think badly of your son, what's, mm -hmm. the, impact, what's the impact on him? Wow. If, you think, if you thought badly of him, what would be the impact on him? It would directly affect how I would treat him? Yes, and how he feels about himself. Yeah. Okay, so therefore, if you put that kind of pressure on him, yeah. for me to think well of you, you mustn't say no to me, then he would suppress himself. This is what happened to you. I don't know your personal story, but some version of this happened to you. So you got the message. So it used to be true, that you had to have people thinking well of you because you needed that for your survival. It's not true anymore. Wow. wow. Okay? And, so, and so this is, so in, in the book, there's a whole chapter that goes through this particular exercise yeah. and it, there's three more steps to it. And no, let me, let me just go ask you then. Um, so, you know, where did you learn? You learned it in your childhood. The next question is, who would you be if you, if you could say no? Who would you be? Who would I be as in what version of myself I would be? Uh, uh, yeah, if you could say no, who would you be? What would that mean for you? If I could say no, it would mean that I would be a much happier, much stronger, much more connected with my inner self person. Yeah, you, and you'd be much freer, wouldn't you? Yes. That's a pretty small word that you're not saying that keeps you from being free and as happy as you could be and as much as yourself as you could be. So that's the next question is, you know, who would you be? And, um, then the, last, and the last question is, this may or may not be true for you, but are there things that you're not saying yes to, that you want to say yes to, but you're not doing it? Because mm. you're too busy, you're too tired, because you don't say no. Is there some activity or some passion or some mm, interest or some creativity, mm. something or, or yourself or your spiritual growth? Is there something that you're not saying yes to? Wow, 100%.
Okay. Even, even for example, Dr. Gabor, sometimes I feel that my marriage is on the back burner because I yeah. give all of myself to everything, my work, my business, my team, my son, my family. And when I come back, I'm just exhausted. Okay. And that affects how I can pour into my husband. Right. So this, so that not saying no has a big price and it yeah. ends up not saying yes where it matters. You know. Yeah. And by the way, I don't know what kids in Singapore are like, but my guess is that at some point, about age and a half, your son started saying something. Yeah. What's that? What did he start saying? He starts saying no. He starts saying no. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. that's nature. Got nature. it. Nature is brilliant. You know why nature does? You know why you can say, why does the nature tell the kid to say yes? You know, hey, it's amazing. For, that's so the, true. The time for supper. Yes. You know, no, but they say no. You know, uh, why do they say no? Because they have to become their own people, and, so, and and they have to learn how to put up a boundary. And behind that boundary, they can become authentically themselves and develop their own will. And so that's why nature has it that way. Unfortunately, families and culture and parents, we make the feel kid feel bad for saying no. And then they start suppressing themselves and they end up, as we've been saying, you know. Wow. Well, that's that's amazing. Because you know, for, for, for me, I've actually had to teach him how to say yes, because all he does, like he, he knows how to say no so much. Uh, but he doesn't know how to say yes, and you don't have, you don't have, you don't have to teach him to say yes. He'll learn it when he needs to. Wow, that's that's a matter of natural development. You never meet any human being that doesn't know how to say yes, unless yeah. somehow they're traumatized. No, no. First, they have to say no, and then they autom then they learn how to say yes. Wow. In in the same vein, workaholism is also something that we develop a compulsive trait that we develop because of our childhood experiences. Yes, that's what happened to me, and because uh, as a child. A bunch of things happened, which I talk about in the book, yeah. that, that made me feel that I wasn't wanted and I wasn't good enough. And so the way to prove my value was to become a workaholic doctor, which means that I was always available for my patients and day or night, they'd call me anytime. And they all thought I was wonderful, just like everybody thinks you're wonderful. And I made more money, so you get rewarded for it. And yeah. at the same time, I'm ignoring my health and I'm ignoring my family. And all because I had to prove that I was worthwhile. So that workaholism... Um, is an attempt to compensate for a sense of inner value. Wow. So how should one have that healthy detachment? Well, I mean, I just, well, that exercise I just gave you. Yeah. Also in that same vein. Do that one, do that once a week, but, but write it down. Those yeah. questions I gave you and in yeah. the midst of normal, you know, there's a chapter on it. Yeah. Uh, do those exercises once a week. That's okay. going to, that's going to change your life. And it seems like, Dr. Gabor, everything that you, you talk about, be it, you know, um, illnesses, physically, mentally, and also, you know, trauma imprints, all boils down to our childhood development and experiences. When yeah. it comes to parenting, what is one thing that you truly believe to be true that few would agree with you on? Well, see, parenting came along in human evolution because the young have to be looked after. They have to be protected and fed and nurtured physically and emotionally. This is true for human beings. This is true for all mammals, even birds. So parenting is an essential natural process. What is the intention of that natural process? Is to meet the needs of the child. If you meet the needs of the child, that child will develop like a normal creature, whether that's a dolphin or an elephant or a cat or a dog or a human being. Yeah. Now, the problem with modern parenting is that it no longer asks what are the needs of the children. What it asks is, how do I want my child to be? And how do I want them to behave? And how do I get them to fit into a society that wants them to be a certain way? And so most parents have no idea what children actually need. And so um, I don't know what it's like in Singapore again, but uh, here in North America, parents, for example, are very stressed. And they no longer have the uncles and the aunts and the grandmothers and the grandfathers around to help with the parenting. That's yeah. how we do it. It's just so the nuclear family. The nuclear family. And they yeah. have to go to work in the morning. So the child wakes them up at night because it's six months of age. The child wants to be held by the parents. The child needs to be held by the parents. You know, So the child cries. The parents are taught, don't pick up the child. And that way the kid will go back to sleep, which they will because they give up and they give in and they get discouraged and they go back to sleep. And the lesson that you've taught them is that their emotions are not important and that they're not important, you know, and 
And you also stress them because the reason the child is crying is because being held is a need of the child. Now, you look at a mother monkey. Have you ever seen a mother monkey not pick up their baby when they're crying? Will you ever see one in nature do that? You never will. Well, human beings are meant to pick up their kids too. When we don't, the child gets stressed, the brains are flooded with stress hormones, and that interferes with healthy development. But in the modern world, nobody's asking, or very few people are asking, what are the child's needs for healthy development? We're asking, how do I make the kid want to behave the way I want them to behave? That's the big mistake of parenting. Wow. Dr. Gabo, how do we reconcile then, you know, as the world has evolved so quickly also, right, with modern day, you know, even like financially, econom uh, economically as well, and today versus, you know, in the earlier days where, you know, there used to be um, that the father would usually be the one to go out to work and the mom would be yeah. at home taking care of the child yeah. all day. But today, it's significantly different. How, how would you advise us as parents today, knowing yeah. in, in, in the world that we live in today, how, how can we also you know, reconcile that with what you just shared? Well, some people have more choice than others. In the United States, for example, 25% of women have to go back to work within two weeks of giving birth. They haven't even recovered from the birth process yet. They have to be back at work. That's because they're poor. They don't have any choice in the matter. That means... 25% of babies are being abandoned by their mothers because the infant, because the infant, not that the mother really wants to abandon the child, but the infant experiences it as an abandonment because the infant physiologically and psychologically, the infant is meant to be with the mother for at least nine months or a year, even two years. Yeah. Now, some people have more choice. I'd say those of those people that have a choice, a parent should stay at home with the child as long as possible. Now, if it's the mother, it's the mother. If the father, then let the father stay home. But Dr. Gabo, is, is, is it specific to it has to be a father or mother or a caregiver? It has to be a primary caregiver that the child is completely attached to and feels safe and comfortable with. Ideally, that would be a parent, yeah. but somebody. When the parents see the child at the end of the day, don't assume it's your child anymore. Wow. Because young babies can only hold, see, here's the thing. If you and your husband, you love each other, he, he might have to travel, you might have to travel. You might not see each other for, say, three months. I just came back from a two-and-a-half-month book tour, you know? But I can hold the love of my wife in my heart. I can connect to her, even if I don't speak to her. Yeah. Babies can't do that. That that doesn't happen for them too much later. The only way they can connect is physically, mm. by, by touching and feeling and smelling and hearing mm. the parent. Now, when you haven't seen them since the morning, you have to get them back. So spend time with them, holding them, being with them becoming their mother and father again at the end of the day. And whenever you have opportunity on the weekend, if you can't be with them during the day, during the week, be with them as much as you can and understand that the child does need to connect to you and to attach to you. So when they're in school the whole day, there's got to be at the end of the day, now we have to get them back. There's a wow. parenting book, there's a parenting book that I helped to write. Yes. It's called Hold On To Your Kids. Yes. And uh, we talk about, you know, it's, it's the work of a brilliant psychologist friend of mine. And he says, collect them before you direct them. Wow. That before, you know, so before you tell them what to do, make sure they're yours. Collect them, put them under your wing again. So in other words, what I'm saying to parents is, I know that conditions are tough in modern society. Yeah. But do your best and to keep the child's attachment needs in the forefront. Let me stand up for a minute. I'll come right back because I want to show you something, okay? Of course. So what I'm showing you here is a cell phone. Yeah. Keep this away from the kids. Don't let them touch it. Don't let them see a screen until they're much older because these things are designed. This isn't, I'm not making this up. It's a new book about it. It just came out two weeks ago. But I say the same thing in the myth of normal. These things are designed to make kids addicted. And when kids get addicted to this, they no longer will listen to you because this becomes much, this is like a drug to a drug addict. And the companies that design the games for the cell phones, they actually are. Um, specifically designed to appeal to the most addictive circuits in a child's brain. And wow. a lot of mothers, a lot of mothers now, they're very stressed and hassled. They have to change the baby's diapers. Yeah. They, give the, they give this to the kid. To distract, yeah. Whereas it used to be, they used to look at each other and talk to each other. Wow. So, so keep the attachment relationship in the forefront and stay away from the technology, for God's sakes. Keep this away. It's poison. Wow. And Dr. Gabor, I know you've said before that the circuits of the brain are shaped by early childhood experiences. Yeah. What, what do you think is the greatest gift that parents can give to 
children? Well, if we're going to talk about brain development, let me uh, quote you something. Yes. This is, um, I quote this in the book, but let me find it right on my computer. It's from an article in a journal, Pediatrics, which is the official journal of the American Pediatric Academy. And this article is from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, which is the world's most prestigious child developmental study institute. Yeah. And this article came out 10 years ago now, and it summed up modern brain science. And I'm going to read you two sentences, okay? Yeah. The interactions of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain and is critically influenced by the mutual responsiveness of adult-child relationships, particularly in the early childhood years. Actually, that's the only sentence I wanted to read you. The point is that the circuits of the brain are shaped by the child's emotional relationships with the adult, so that the brain is a biological organ, but that biology is actually shaped by our emotional interactions. So the kind of relationship that children have with their parents will have a huge impact on their brain development. And I don't make this stuff up. This is modern brain science. So that when, when, when anything interferes with the healthy relationship between mother or father and, ch and child, that'll have a negative effect on the child's brain development. So if you look at by all over the world, more and more kids are being diagnosed with learning problems yeah. and attention problems. Yeah. It's because because the brains are being affected by the stress on the parents. And wow. I'm, not I'm not blaming the parents. I'm saying this is the modern world. This is why I call it a toxic culture. That's the subtitle of the book. The myth of normal trauma, illness, and healing in a toxic culture. This culture is toxic to healthy human development in all the ways that we've been talking about. And and knowing knowing that, Dr. Gabor, in, in this society today that we live in, that is only going to be exacerbated, what is the most important skill that we as parents can impart to our kids? Well, the... Um... Great Buddhist teacher uh, and monk uh, Thich Nhat Han, who died um, just over a, about a year ago now, he once said that the biggest gift a child can give to their parents is their own happiness, the parents' own happiness. Because if the parents are happy, then the child thinks because the children take everything personally. If the parents are happy, they think, "Oh, I must be really great." But if the parents are unhappy, I'm not good enough. So the biggest gift is parents need to look at their own lives and their relationships and how they feel about themselves. And the, and then they can meet the child's needs. So, you know, that's a very simple thing to say. But really what I'm saying is that the most important mm, influence on the child's development is the quality of their relationship with the adults and the more attuned and emotionally present and supportive and uh, accepting the parents can be the healthier the child's going to be, and that child, and that child will develop into be a cooperative, socially conscious creature. You don't have to worry about that. You just have to meet their needs. Which also means, Doctor Gabor, there's so much work that we as parents need to do. There's so much self awareness. There's so much consciousness and intentionality that we need to have. Yeah, in this world, it didn't used to be that way. Like a, a mother orangutan, a mother monkey, doesn't have to be conscious and do a read all that. You know. But, but you, we humans have got so far away from our beginnings. We used to live in small groups when lots of adults were around, the kids were playing around, other kids out in nature, you know, because so far away from that, that I agree with you today, <laughs> excuse me, we do have to be conscious. We do have to be very aware. It's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. If, if you could only choose one, what is one thing that you think human beings need to thrive in this world? Be self, know yourself, be self-aware, Un understand when you're, you know, the Buddha said to his monks, when the, the Buddha never said, don't be angry or don't be unhappy, but he said, when the monk is unhappy, he's aware that he's unhappy. When the monk is angry, she's aware that she's angry. So be mm -hmm. self-aware, be aware, get, you know, do the work to get to know yourself. Got it. And Dr. Gabo, is there one thing that you have, one thing that you attribute to the growth and self-awareness and inner work that you've done in your life that has also transformed you to become a much better and happier person? I have to confess, I'm not always the happiest person in the world, you know, so it's, I'm not pretend I've gained some enlightenment. But I have a question before, I'll answer that, but I have a question for you before I do. 
Yes. A number of times when you asked the question, you said, what's the one? Why does it have to be one? That's yeah. it. You know why? I got my own answer to that. I don't know. What you, well, well, let me hear your answer. Then I'll give you mine. Because I think it, 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 it's one seems a lot more digestible. It's, you know, it's less overwhelming where it's easier for me or us as human beings to be able to focus on and work on. Yeah. Well, I think that's the problem with the modern world is that we don't even have time to pay attention to the important things. And if something is a little bit more complex, if it isn't just the one, then we say, oh, we don't have time for that, you know? And yeah. I think that's too bad. So in answer to your question, um, I couldn't isolate. I've done therapy for myself. You know, I, I, a lot of reading, a lot, lot of self-contemplation. I've, I've worked with psychedelic plants sometimes as I write about in this book. I've attended retreats. I've attended meditation retreats. I've studied yeah. spiritual teachers, Hindu spiritual teachers. Um, I've read the I Ching, you know, the Bhagavad Gita and mm. the Christian Bible and the Jewish scriptures and uh, listened to various teachers. I've attended meditation retreats. Um, but if but if you ask me the biggest thing, it's the relationship with my wife. Because to be, it's just our nature that we want to, to be true to ourselves and we wanted the truth and it's, it's been a lot of work you know and it's ongoing work but that's been the if if you ask me for one big area that's the one but by itself it would not have been enough yeah for but, sure. but that's the biggest one for me well but thank you for reflecting that back to me dr gabor I, I i really learned so much um and i have one one i had to say one now but no I, before I end, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Gabor, can you walk us through the thought process or the reflection process that goes on in your head when you catch yourself being triggered by something or acting out? <laughs> yeah, happened last week. Uh, I, I was at a restaurant and they ordered a big soup and they brought me a little soup. Uh -huh. you know? No, I got triggered. Why did I get triggered? By the way, what does it mean to get triggered? Um, the trigger is a very small little thing, isn't it? The reason the trigger is so dangerous is because there's ammunition and an explosive charge. If I get triggered, I could blame the other person for triggering it, me. You triggered me. Or can look at what's the explosive charge inside me. And so that's what you have to reflect on. What is the explosive in me? So in my case, I've been traveling for three months, almost three months, with this mm. new book, The mm. Myth of Normal. I've been to the United States, Canada, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. The book is being published in 28 languages, including Chinese and Japanese and wow, congratulations. Vietnamese, Vietnamese and Thai and Lithuanian and wow. Polish. And, and anyway, but the point is, I was traveling a lot and I got very tired. I didn't say no because I wanted this book to be a big success, you know. Uh, and so I came home tired, depleted. I had not been taking care of myself. And... I get the wrong size soup. Now, there's a role trigger there as well because as an infant, I start. So you get me tired and then you get me frustrated because you're not giving me the soup that I wanted. And all of a sudden, this best-selling author and physician and healer <laughs> and expert, expert is behaving like a baby in the body of an adult. Not very pretty. And my wife and my son had to call me and they had to say to me, that, you know, you should look at yourself and so i had to look what was going on for me you know i had to really reflect on i thought i was past it i thought i wouldn't get triggered like that anymore but there it was it was a week ago yesterday wow and, and you know what at the next table were some people that recognized me when i walked into the restaurant and they saw me behave this way so i looked really bad you know what but that's the price you pay that's the price i have to pay mm -hmm. and it's if I, it's a lesson I had to learn. Mm -hmm. The good news is that we can always learn. So these, yes. when, we get, when we get triggered, it's always a teaching. It's always a teaching moment and an opportunity to grow. I, I have to ask you this. I'm so curious, Dr. Gabo. What is your definition of success? Is um, following your calling. That's my definition of success. Um, now, you know, I mean, I don't own that word. Some people might think that success is earning a lot of money. Um, um, 
or looking good or being loved by everybody or you know admired or climbing a mountain but for me it's for me it's having a passion having a calling and following it that's what success is and you know like with this book and when i was writing the book at some point i got really actually anxious because i thought oh my god this this is too big i can't do this this time i've taken on too much and then what will i look like you know then i then i look like a failure and my blood pressure started going up and i had to realize that the problem wasn't the book the problem was that i was identifying myself with the book because if i was writing the book because there's some truth that i wanted to speak i was doing it and whether everybody liked it or they didn't like it it wouldn't matter so much but if i'm doing the book because i want to succeed and be popular or be uh, seen as a successful author well then i can make myself really sick thinking about what happens if i don't succeed so the real success is writing the book not in how many people buy it wow for me wow. just as an example no wow. it so happens it so happens a lot of people are buying it but <laughs> but but that's because exactly i was going to say I, I I did what I can to put my truth into it. Yeah. Know? And committing to the process and the journey rather than focusing on the outcomes, which is what actually so much so many of us struggle with today. Dr. Gabor, do you have any questions for me? Well, look, I'd love to sit down with you and have coffee with you someday or or lunch and get to know you because I, I like I really the way you ask questions and I also like how open you are to answering it when I ask you questions. So Oh, I think it would be, so there's many things that I would want to ask you if I had the time of I course I would love to Dr. Gabo and I think there's so much that you can pour into my life and my community's life yeah, um yeah. well there's so much I would love to go deeper in Dr. Gabo but I want to respect your time and thank you so much for also taking time to speak with me uh today okay. yeah and I hope to see you soon thank you for all the great work that you're doing it's really like I said it's far reaching it's reaching all of us even in Singapore uh mm -hmm. and May you continue to do what you do, um, you know, like you said, follow your calling and, and continue to inspire all of us to heal in our journey and follow our calling too. Thank you so much. It's very nice to meet both of you and thanks for giving me this platform to, to talk to your followers. Thank you.